Paul, I think this focus on Roger Stone is fascinating because the speculation has been that either he or Mike Flynn may be kind of the connective tissue that links former President Trump to the rioters, right? And here's what one of the filmmakers said just this morning on Morning Joe about that connection. What was your understanding about how close Roger Stone was during those weeks, those important months up to and after the election to Donald Trump? He didn't communicate directly with Trump while we were together with him, but he, I mean, you could sense that he was uh, communicating a lot with aides around uh, the Trump campaign. Aides around the Trump campaign. Paul, that doesn't sound like a definitive link to me. Does the committee need to show that connection between Trump and the violent mob that it exists? Does it hurt their case if they can't do that? Well, it doesn't hurt their case because they've got plenty of evidence, even if it's not direct eyewitness testimony. It's clear that in some sense, Roger Stone was a go-between the actual election didn't matter to Stone. The vote didn't matter. So we know that the big lie was a criminal conspiracy that actually started before the election. And it wasn't just the fake elector scheme, but it was also the violence of Insurrection Day that was also part of the plan. And Chris, the Department of Justice is on this. We know that it has two different grand jury investigations of January 6th. One about the fake elector scheme, but the other, I think, is directly tied to this new evidence. The department is investigating the blood and violence of January 6th. So, Michael, uh, look, uh, what are you looking for tomorrow? I mean, I, I haven't heard anybody use the phrase smoking gun, but what would constitute a smoking gun or what would at least be impactful that says, wow, they really wrap this up big? What are you looking for, Michael? Well, I think a lot of this has been a smoking gun. It has been just one long smoking trail uh, from the very beginning, uh, very effectively played out, uh, laid out by the committee. I think for tomorrow, I, I think uh, to Ali's reporting is how you begin to capstone this. Whether there are one or two more hearings after tomorrow remains to be seen. But the sense is this is the the final um, presentation of the big evidence, and so I'm going to be looking for what that big evidence uh, is, how they how they connect those dots, how that connective tissue holds up um, under the scrutiny of of you know expert uh, legal analysis, like uh, from my friend uh, Paul Butler there. You know when he sees that, when lawyers look at this, when the DOJ looks at this. What do they take away from the narrative that's been presented by this committee? Because as we all know, the end game has been to present credible information that could lead to potential prosecution. Because the genesis of this committee was crimes were committed. Now we have to go out and show where that bread trail is, direct legal authorities towards it uh, in the way, given they didn't have absolute authority uh, to, you know, to bring the kind of humph, you know, umph to the to the fight. Uh, they're going to leave that for the legal side of this. The committee, I think, from my standpoint, has laid out a lot of that. We'll see how they close it out tomorrow with this evidence. A little bit of a hiccup with Denver Riggleman uh, over the weekend, uh, for sure, putting out uh, some early narrative that they necessarily didn't want on the street. How they clean that up is going to be important to watch as well. Um, but we'll see. I, I think they've done a good job. Hopefully they can close the case and the DOJ and others now have the ability to move forward. Paul, I want to ask you about the legal side of another story that's out there. It has to do with the Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton. He was being subpoenaed for a federal court hearing today in an abortion-related lawsuit against the state. At least that was the plan. The Texas Tribune, reporting on an affidavit, quotes the process server, a man named Ernesto Herrera, saying this. I walked up the driveway approaching Mr. Paxton and called him by his name. As soon as he saw me and heard me call his name out, he turned around and ran back inside the house through the same door in the garage. A few minutes later, I saw Mr. Paxton. He ran from the door inside the garage toward the rear door beside the drive behind the driver's side. I approached the truck and loudly called him by his name and I stated I had court documents for him. Mr. Paxton ignored me and kept heading for the truck. The Tribune says, quote, Herrera eventually placed the subpoenas on the ground near the truck and told him he was serving him with a subpoena. 
But both cars drove away, leaving the documents on the ground. First of all, your reaction to that, uh, he said there was a stranger in his yard, so he was, I guess, afraid. But if you're a process server and you leave documents and you yell at somebody, is that legal? Is that fulfill being served? Tell me what you make of all of this. So, Chris, as a lawyer, I'm embarrassed by the attorney general's conduct here. It'd be embarrassing for any member of the bar, much less someone who's the attorney general. But the message from the law on this issue is that you can run, but you can't hide. And so it will be determined by state law whether this actually counts. But the Texas attorney general is not a person who it's difficult to find. So we can be sure that at some point there will be a legal process where he will be formally notified. Really, the important question is, what's he trying to hide? Michael, what's your take on this? A Republican attorney general literally running away from a court-ordered subpoena. Yeah, um, it kind of smells funny to me. I mean, what are you running from? What do you, what do you, what do you have to hide? Um, you're the attorney general. You know how this process works. Um, this is, this is the truth of, of where we are right now. All of these people who've gotten caught up in, in hiding the ball, trying to play down the facts, ignoring the facts, um, and now that the law is coming after them to get them on the record, to hold them accountable for their behavior, their words, et cetera, um, they're running. They're showing what cowards they really are. Um, so Paul's exactly right. You can run, baby, but you can't hide. We know where you work. <laughs> we, we just bring it to the office. You don't, you, we're not going to leave it by the road. We'll just bring it by the office and leave it on your secretary's desk. Service is not a complicated process, people. I mean, and, you know, to, to do what he did just shows just how childish uh, all of this behavior is, how immature it is, and how unfit for public service all of them are who hide from the law, particularly when they've been sworn to uphold the law. You are accountable, and we're going to serve you. The state is going to serve you. The people on behalf, you know, the government on behalf of the American people are going to serve you. You will be brought to heel on for your behavior and your word. So, you know, I hope you had a nice skirt around the truck and hiding from a process server, but at the end of the day, just put it on his desk. He'll show up. He has to. Michael Steele, Paul Butler, Ali Vitale, as we look ahead to tomorrow, thank you so much.